It's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce Nina Sokolov today. Um, Nina is a PhD student in the lab of Mike Boots, who's in integrative biology at Berkeley. And she has managed to combine incredible talents in the art and outreach and education world with scientific prowess of being a great field biologist who's interested in the evolutionary ecology of insects and in infectious disease, which is the specialty of the Boots Lab. Um, so her opening logo here shows what other lab mates are working on, but Nina's specialty has been bees, the honeybees that are used in industrial agriculture to pollinate our almonds and then shipped, as you probably, many of you know, in giant vans all around the U.S. to pollinate crops, fruit, fruits in uh, New England, and then they come back and come across the country and do our almonds. So they're widely exposed in their travels, and they're also exhausted. And then they are rested after they do almonds in California in natural lands, natural private lands. But I wanted to put in a tiny plug here for some of Nina's study sites where she studies the interactions of these commercial honeybees with our native wild bees are in the outskirts of natural reserves. So the ranches around Point Reyes or some of the private mountain escapes for our, of and ranches for folks that live in the Northern Sierra around the Sage Hen Reserve. And the question is, these bees, the honeybees and the wild bees are sharing flowers. They both pollinate the same flowers. So the big question is, are flowers dirty doorknobs? And with that, I'll let Nina hold forth and you'll see her incredible merger of art and science and great um, field ecology and infectious disease detective work. So take it away, Nina. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, it means a lot coming from from you. Uh, that that yeah, it just really warms my heart, and I'm so excited to be talking to you all today about my dissertation research. Um, Overall, this is, I mean, Mary kind of set it up really beautifully, but I'm going to be talking about all the different sorts of field systems and all the connected ways that I think about these questions and disease ecology of bees. Um, overall, I think that Zoom lectures are, you know, a little challenging to focus on the whole time, so I'd love to break it up throughout. Um, I'll have summaries throughout the different sections of my talk, and so if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat, and then we can be addressing them throughout um, just to break up the the, the droning on of, of my dissertation research a little bit. Um, but overall, today we'll be talking about the viruses infecting managed honeybees and native wild bees. Um, and some background here that I'm in the sixth year of my my PhD, um, trying to wrap up in the not too distant future, but having a pandemic in the middle of all of this is particularly challenging. Um, so trying to get caught up on the lab work and everything, but hoping to finish in the near future. An outline for today's talk, I'm going to be talking about declines in bees, um, what we know, what we don't know, virus spillover, pretty much I specialize in the virus side of things, but there's lots of reasons behind their declines, and I'll be talking across a range of the three field systems that I've developed in my time here um, in the almonds in the Sierra and around Marin County. So here's me at one of the yards in the Sierra, and you can see that there's... Um, electrical fence surrounding these hives in order to protect them from bears. <laughs> uh, so that's a big, big kind of concern up in the Sierra. That's not, well, there was like one lone bear in Marin County that was tearing some stuff up recently, but not as big of a deal. Um, lots of people know about bees and care about bees. So I feel very lucky in that regard. I don't have to convince them exactly why my research is important. Um, Pretty much this uh, article was showing how a world without bees, a price we'll pay if we don't figure out what's killing the honeybee. And that is kind of the setting that I've entered into this um, with. And overall, the concern here is that, and I had a more update, no, I don't know, I had a more updated figure, but it's, it's similar, if not a little bit more of this past winter. During the winter of 2018, an estimated 38% of managed honeybee colonies were lost. Um, so yeah, that's that's an insane amount of hives that are lost every year, and that's about the same for this year's losses. 
This has been seen on the news with honeybees dying at alarming rates. And why is that? That's in part due to this parasitic mite named Varroa destructor, um, which arrived to California only in the 80s. It is effectively... Um, um, I am seeing... I don't see anything either. My screen is blank. Hmm. How are other, are I, other people I'm, seeing I'm, it? Should I'm, I reshare my screen? Um, Nina, I see it. I see a really beautiful picture of a, a larval bee with a mite on it and then a honeybee flying, probably also. Mm -hmm. with so we are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, We got okay. a, a chat saying I can see the speaker, but not the talk. I wonder. Yeah, it sounds let me like just try to few people, but. Yeah, you can try resharing. I was also seeing it. Yeah, okay. Hmm. How's, okay. How's this for? I, I'm getting it loud and clear. Yeah, it looks good to me. Yeah. I say go ahead and I'll and I'll work with them in the chat to see if I can help them. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So this parasitic mite is kind of the big um, cons the cause of a lot of the declines that we've and the hardship behind beekeeping in recent years. As you can see, it's it's a very large mite. It's effectively the size of a dinner plate on um, the bee's body, and they are sucking up their fat bodies, which is an important organ for immune function in bees. And in addition to that, they're not just this tick that sucks up a, a really important immunological organ, they're also vectoring viruses to them. So they're acting like a little mosquito and they can vector viruses, um, but we don't really know if it's a mechanical vector or biological vector. And the difference there is they're just able to suck up and spit them out in the case of a mechanical vector or a biological vector they're able to replicate inside of the bee. So um, we don't really know that yet. It's kind of what came first, the chicken or the egg, but I have an assumption that some viruses have evolved to do the latter. Um, this spread of this mite started from Southeast Asia, where it spilled over from the Eastern honeybee onto the Western honeybee that we use in agriculture, and has since spread all across the world. Um, it says that it's absent in Australia in this figure, but literally this year it has arrived in Australia, even despite having very strict uh, importation measures, they still arrived. And again, they came to the to California, at least in the 80s. And overall, it became a lot harder to be a beekeeper. This new mite, this honeybee doesn't have any adaptations to deal with it. And it's just got, you know, it has continued to experience a lot of losses because of that. However, if you zoom out and you look at the worldwide numbers of honeybees, you can see that since the 60s, honeybee hive numbers have gone up and worldwide as well as in the US. So in the past 50 years, honeybee hive numbers have increased by 45%. So it's like, oh, what's what's the concern? The numbers are going up. Um, but the concern there is that the fraction that depend to some amount on animal pollination has risen by 300% in that same time. So there's more humans and the humans that are born want more animal pollinated crops. So the concern here is that it's not enough to meet demand. And how are we do? How is this happening? How are we losing almost half of all hives every year, but the numbers are still increasing? That's due to beekeeper management, where you can take one strong hive and split them, requeen them, and from that you get two hives. Um, so beekeepers are able to manage um, some of these losses, um, but it's still overall a lot of labor, <laughs> and sometimes the losses are too severe, and beekeepers have to buy hives from other people in order to fulfill their pollination contracts, and overall it's just become a lot harder to be a beekeeper. But that's just one species, you know, that's just the, the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera. Um, but in California, there's 1600 species of native bees. Um, and in the Bay Area, there's a few, two, 300. So well, how are they all doing? Effectively, we have almost no idea. Um, in order to claim something's in decline, you needed to know what it was 50 years ago, 30 years ago today to show that it's in decline because insect populations, they oscillate a lot. And so you have to have these long term temporal trends. And for a lot of bees, we just simply don't have that. The best data that we do have is for the bumblebees, which are kind of the panda bears of the insect world, right? Um, Bombus franklini um, on the, the, the top image um, is on the brink of extinction. In fact, 
Most likely, it could be very well extinct. Um, the last time that it was detected was in 2006 in Northern California by the late Robin Thorpe, who is a prolific bumblebee biologist from UC Davis that recently passed. Um, but I was always saying if he couldn't find it, like I'm not sure if it's there anymore. There's also a more local example with Bombus occidentalis, which is the Western bumblebee that has experienced dramatic declines in abundance and range in the last few decades. And I believe it's up to 60% declines in abundance. And in general, the IUCN lists a quarter of North American bumblebees under threat. And more recent news, the California, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife won some protection for four of these bee species, including these two, to be listed under the California Endangered Species Act. So that just happened last year, and they're beginning to roll out what that kind of means. What do those protections mean for these bees? So one big takeaway that I want everyone to walk away from this talk with is that there's honeybee issues in the U.S., and then there's native bee issues in the U.S., because honeybees were brought over by European colonizers in the 17th century, and they are critical for our agricultural system that we have developed thus far. Um, but their losses are strictly, a in the U.S., a agricultural issue and a management issue. You can think of them as tiny livestock, just like chickens and cattle. Um, they are not native, and they are crucial for crops. On the other hand, there's native bees, like I said, 1600 in California alone, uh, and these are considered conservation issues because they're native to, to these lands and are critical not only for crops, they've been showing to be really, really beneficial for crops. They're better specialists, they're able to fly in the rain, while honeybees, if it's raining, they don't want to go out there. They're like, ah, we'll just stay inside, we got our honey, we don't got to worry about it. But native bees are solitary, they don't got their honey, they have to go out there even if the conditions aren't so good. Um, so having a more diverse agriculture cultural system is really important, um, I believe. And so they're really important for both wildflowers, so the native flowers that they've co-evolved with, as well as for crops. So a little summary, honeybees face large overwintering losses in part due to these mites. Um, and their numbers are increasing due to the, this ability of hive splitting, but the concern is that we might not be able to meet demand. Um, overall, we don't know how most bumblebee, how most bees are doing, um, but some are highly threatened with four bumblebees just winning some protection by the state. Um, and again, there's this intrinsic differences between agricultural issues and conservation issues. And the Save the Bee movement has kind of confounded them, and so I like to, to piece those apart. Um, does that make any intrinsic sense um, for everyone? I feel like Does to me. Is still... <laughs> yes, I think. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I will continue. But like I said, if anything is strange, surprising, interesting, please throw it in the chat. I'd love to see. Um, so declines, why are they happening? You know, it's kind of the same sort of cast of characters as most uh, life on earth is experiencing this. It's climate change, it's habitat fragmentation, it's stress, pesticides, poor diet and disease. And these are all kind of depending on the situation a different combination of factors. Um, but I focus in on the disease aspect Specifically, I want to know what are the dynamics of uh, viruses, viral sharing between managed and wild bee species, um, because could that be why some of them are in, why some are in decline? Could that be contributing to honeybee losses? Could that be contributing to native bee losses? Overall, there's 31 known uh, honeybee viruses, quote unquote honeybee viruses. We call them that because we found them in the honeybee in the first place. But in reality, we have no idea where any of these came from, almost, except one deformed wing virus. We have a good bit of evidence showing that it's a honeybee origin. But they are aptly named for their most severe forms of themselves, chronic bee paralysis virus leading in the top left, leading to hairlessness, shivering, and overall paralysis and a rapid death, sac brood vi virus on the right where larvae turn black and never emerge. And in the bottom, we've got deformed wing virus where um, the bee emerges as an adult with deformities in their wings and a bee that can't fly, can't really live very long. Um, so either that or they're named after the region that they're found near. Um, so overall, with pathogen spillover, I used to have to define that a little bit, but now with COVID and the pandemic, we are living in a spillover event, but that can happen between any different species. It just means one species is giving a new species of some sort of pathogen. 
And overall, there's a heavy focus on viruses, on RNA viruses specifically, because they can mutate really, really rapidly. Um, and they can that means that once they have the chance to get into a new host, they can mutate to potentially adapt to that new host pretty easily as well. And so there's some crazy stories of plant viruses infecting bees. Um, and I'm, yeah, I think that that is crazy, a jump from plant to animal immune systems. But I think RNA viruses are just not playing by any biological rules that we are confining them to. Overall, by allowing managed bees to mix with wild bees, there is a potential for disease emergence via sharing contaminated floral resources. So spillover for a bee happens when a infected bee goes and forages on a flower and then sheds virus on, the, on that flower. Usually it's fecal oral transmitted, so they poop on the flower, then they leave, and then another bee comes, forages on that same flower and picks up some amount of infectious virions or virus particles. And so that, we don't know how long these flowers are infectious for. We don't know what that infection, how many virus particles they need to consume before they get sick. But most likely the more stressed an animal is, the more, the lower that dose has to be for an infection to take hold. The graph on the right just shows the different acronyms of viruses with deformed wing virus on the left shown in the most number of species with the most number of publications. But this is in 2016. So I think the numbers have changed a bit. Overall transmission for these, these pathogens can be all, all, all types, horizontal between B to B with direct contact, vertical from mother to offspring, environmental, where there's these contaminated floral resources and vector mediated. So that, that might, that vectors viruses to them as well. So here's a little illustration on the right, of uh, three different um, types of bees um, and they're all sharing a flower and, and uh, you know, have the chance of maybe getting one another sick. Pathogenicity or how deadly, you know, what kind of symptoms arise from these pathogens is very variable. Um, it's quite hard and people showing these things in the lab are having a hard time with it. And that's because it depends on so many things from the strain to the dose, how many virus particles they got, the nutritional status of the bee, are they in a starvation condition, are they well fed? Um, and this overall coalesces in this idea of condition-dependent virulence. So condition-dependent, um, depending on the condition of the host, and virulence being how deadly that pathogen is, um, it really depends on how the bee is doing. So here on the left, we have an image of a nice environment. There's lots of flowers. There's maybe one infected honeybee hive around, but they're not that stressed. They're not shedding that much. There's a bumblebee in that environment. And even though they pick up that viral infection, they're not stressed and they experience low virulence. And you might not even be able to tell that they're sick without molecular techniques. Um, in this other situation, say there's really, really high densities, the flowers aren't great, even if it's the same viral strains, just the more stressed conditions alone could lead to an increase in virulence or how deadly that pathogen is. So for someone like me, it's a little frustrating where you like can't just tell if a bee is sick just by looking at them. A lot of those names are suggesting that you'd be able to tell the symptoms, but that's only in their most virulent form. There's a lot of asymptomatic or, um, you know, infections that you couldn't notice by eye alone. Um, and so that requires molecular techniques to determine if they are sick with something. But this also gives um, positive credence towards land stewardship, where if we can design environment or help steward environments and ecosystems towards being as less, least stressful as possible, that will allow for the bees to mediate and to fight off the infections um, that they do get exposed to. So these are just kind of the focal viruses that I work on. Um, deformed wing virus, it's honeybee in origin. Like I said, that's the one that we know. Um, this is the image that Mary has as her background that I've also used as my business card showing an osmium mining bee on the top with a bumblebee in the middle and a honeybee um, going and, and foraging on infected lupin flowers. Um, lakes and eye virus is also a focal virus of mine. It's newly discovered. We pretty much don't know anything that it does, but it's really diverse and it's kind of associated with this almond pollination bloom. There's sac root virus that I mentioned before and black queen cell virus, which is like sac root virus, but specifically targets queen uh, larvae that are destined to be queens for honeybees. So a kind of central nexus of my work um, focuses on the almond bloom in California, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, one, it's local. It, it happens in the Central Valley every year. 
where every year 70% of all honeybees in the U.S. have to congregate in the Central Valley to pollinate 80% of the world's almonds. Um, and with them, they bring all the diseases that they were exposed to. There's not really any regulation to this. Um, and then afterwards, they've been exposed to these viruses, and then they're placed on wild lands. And the question is, do we see these viruses that they were exposed to in the almond bloom start to crop up in the native bees? Because for a lot of reasons, when you're taking 70% of an entire population of an organism and congregating them into one spot, that is a bad idea from a disease evolution perspective. For reasons that I won't go into, that sort of situation can lead to the evolution of increased virulence or how deadly that these viruses are. So I feel like we got to focus on the viral strain evolution in this system because this could be kind of a uh, breeding ground for more deadly diseases for bees. Overall, I want to know, does this mass importa importation of honeybees into California impact the viral community of both the honeybees and then the wild bees that they're interacting with? Um, Here's some images from the almond fields that I've worked in. Uh, and a lot, I guess, in a more zoomed out way, a lot of what my lab works on that I'm a part of, Boots Lab, is disease ecology. And so for a lot of that, we need to be thinking um, through time um, getting this 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 longitudinal temporal data of uh, bees kind of going through this bloom through time or either like this in a crop environment, but also like in a wild environment as well, um, getting samples through time to understand what are these viral dynamics doing? What's the seasonality of it? What's the ecology of the virus? And so for that, most of this stuff I'm sampling through time. In 2021, um, even though I've sampled in many years, but I'm trying to get like a little snapshot to be able to put into a chapter and be able to get out of here type deal, um, though much more will come afterwards. Um, pretty much at each time point, I collected from, okay, so to zoom out a second, one thing that's always confused me is what scale is important when working for with honeybee stuff because there's the oper the beekeeping operation where there's one person in charge of how all these thousands of hives get treated. So when you look between operations, there's a lot of variation. So for this, I'm just working with one beekeeper. And then they place, as you can see kind of in the bottom right, um, these drops of clusters of hives of about 25 hives. And then that those are spread out maybe every 500 meters or so um, with these clusters of 25. And so when I was designing this, I'm like, what scale is important? You know, how much variation is there between hives in those clusters and then between hives and like the drops, you know what I mean? Um, and pretty much we don't know. And so I designed this to see if what scale do we need to be sampling these things on? Is it, is it, yeah. So I, I, I feel like that's a simple thing, a simple analysis, just looking between all the different hives in these clusters through time. Um, but overall, I looked at six hives per drop across six drops, so 36 hives total, and I compared them to control hives that didn't go to the almonds at all. And there's not many <laughs> for that because, again, beekeepers are coming out of the winter having faced the highest losses <laughs> of the season, and then the almonds are blooming in February. It's really kind of the biggest pollination event of the year at just after a time in which beekeepers have experienced the most loss. So it's very challenging um, for beekeepers, but that's where, they, a lot of, that's where a lot of their income is generated from usually. Um, overall, I was monitoring 40 hives through time where I looked before the almonds bloomed, once the almonds were blooming, and then once the almonds were done blooming in March, and then one more time when all of these, the control and the migratory hives came back together. Um, and then a subset of those hives that are destined to be queen breeders were brought up to high elevation Sierra sites that I work in later. So it's all it's all connected. Like I said, there's the central nexus of the almonds, but then these bees go to different locations depending on the beekeeping operation. So this is kind of what the view is. It is a mass monoculture, you know, so it's as far as living things go, it's you, the bees, the trees, and the dirt and <laughs> not much else as far as living things go. Um, and here I'm wondering, are um, 
Bees exposed to no novel viruses during the bloom. Is the bloom event stressful immunologically? Um, do we see an upregulation of immune genes for the hives that are going through the bloom? And how do these patterns change through time? Again, I got that temporal sampling. And what scale is important? Does it, is it the hive? Is it the drop? Is it the yard? Is the operation? You know, we just don't know. So I wanted to address all those questions. I was sampling all those bees, putting them onto dry ice, into liquid nitrogen, bringing them back to the lab, doing extraction, cDNA synthesis, and uh, also sending um, this stuff off for mRNA sequencing. Um, here's a heat map that might be literally impossible to read, so I apologize for that. Um, but essentially, I'm looking at the different viruses that were found in these samples. In general, black queen cell virus was prevalent throughout all the hives, um, whether or not they were in the almonds or not, uh, but it seems like they had higher bead counts in, in the almonds. Lake Sinai virus, um, there was a bunch more different st uh, strains of the virus in the almonds um, in comparison to the control hives. So that'll be kind of an interesting analysis to look forward to. Um, black queen cell virus, oh no, sorry, I already talked about that one, deformed wing virus. It's barely in the control hives at all, but it's shown to start kind of really popping up in the bees that are going through the almonds. Um, and in sac brood virus, we don't see it at all in the control bees by finding it in low prevalence with the almonds. And then interestingly enough, Prunus ring spot virus. Prunus is the genus for cherries and almonds. So this is a plant virus that was found kind of all over the almond bees um, and even on the bees before the almonds bloom. That's not to say that, you know, who's to say where that's coming from? They could have, there could have been almonds blooming in the perimeter that I wasn't, you know, aware of or seeing. But I think that figuring out is this just an external, is this just on the pollen that they're collecting? Is this external? Is this actually internal in the bee? Did they consume it? And do we find it actively replicating is um, stuff that I won't look at, but a lab mate um, who's interested in the role of pollen and all of these disease transmission events, um, Sarah Herajon Chavez, she's going to be looking into it. So stay tuned. Um, I feel like I will maybe continue past this, but this was just looking at a quick phylogeny. So the relatedness of these different strain uh, of this, um, the sequences for Lake Sinai virus. Um, and yeah, I feel like this is all very preliminary stuff. So I'm not going to have many conclusions for these sorts of things, but the green was indicating the, the control sites um, versus the purple was the treatment sites. And we can see that this um, the little bar on top is relative distance away from one another. And this one's very diverged <laughs> for the control hive, but it's related to the like um, to a to an almond hive, but this sort of makes sense because this is at the fourth time point when they've come together again. So I think that there's about to be some wacky, <laughs> wacky things to do with this, looking all through the, the different timelines, comparing the control versus the treatment. And overall, this is a work in progress, but I kind of just wanted to share what sorts of things could be coming out from that. Um, so that's the almond side of things. And then, like I said, those bees, they're in the almonds, then they are brought together again um, for a few months um, before they go up to these high elevation Sierra wildflower sites. So why do I want to work up in the Sierra, you know, other than it being very, very beautiful? Um, it's also scientifically incredibly interesting. They're, it boasts high wildflower and bee diversity, um, and at the same time, very low honeybee density. Um, as I showed at the beginning, there's this um, electrical fence around here because bears can destroy your hives, and that sucks when you spent... 250 plus dollars per box and the nuke nukes and everything associated with it. It's a lot of money to lose to a bear that's just wanting some snacks. Um, so it's beekeeping isn't quite as popular as it is around here. And overall, the cold winters can kill off a lot of the feral colonies of honeybees that be establishing in the wild. So what that means for me is that I can go to these meadows and experimentally um, place these honeybee hives there and sample the native bee community before and after honeybee arrival. 
with this, I'm asking questions about are viruses circulating in bumblebees before honeybee arrival? Do honeybees bring viruses with them when they migrate? And what are the dynamics across different viruses? Um, like I said, there's 31 different viruses. We have no idea the origins. I would posit that some of them are honeybee in origin and some of them are wild bee in origin. The life history strategies of those two are very, very different. Honeybees are alive as a whole colony of 30 to 50,000 individuals strong all year. And that's really different from native bees, uh, bumblebees, for example, where every year everyone dies but the new queens. So a pathogen that can has evolved to bonk around in one of 30,000 individuals versus one that has to go through a time period of eight months underground overwintering in a queen and not trying to kill her off before you know they can emerge and transmit again. Those are just very different life history strategies. So I bet different viruses that we'll be looking at are, have different origins naturally because they have to adapt to these very different host life history strategies. This is in the Tahoe National Forest, um, as Mary uh, mentioned. So this like kind of long red line, that's all my sampling points between um, the highway and Sage Hen Creek Field Station, which is a UC Berkeley Reserve. But overall, these are my different sampling sites kind of around areas that um, I had three sites that had experimentally placed honeybee hives there and then other sites that are in perimeter that are hopefully similar enough to act like a control site wildflower wise, but hopefully far enough away from honeybees to have them not show up <laughs> essentially. But that is non-trivial to figure out all those things. So the sampling scheme in 2021 was that, like I said, they went to the to the almonds. I was sampling, and then wherever there's like a little bee on this this meant this graphic is where I did a sampling event. Um, which there should be even more bees for the almonds. Anyway, I'll add those. Um, then they go to the stopover site, um, and I sample the native bee communities before the honeybees arrive. And then once honeybees arrive, I sample them three more, uh, three times after that. So today I'll just be focusing in on this little section of before the honeybees arrived and then once the honeybees arrived. Overall, the field work for this consisted of nine sites um, where I was taking bee diversity metrics, floral diversity metrics, and collecting bees for viruses. Again, that's onto dry ice into a liquid nitrogen dewer in the car. Since they're RNA viruses, they're very sensitive to degradation, and so they need to be kept at ultra cold temperatures, otherwise they'll degrade. Then bringing them back to the lab and doing RNA extractions and, and all that molecular good stuff to figure out what they're infected with. Um, with the diversity metrics for the bees, that's pretty much getting a collection, like an entomological collection of bees at each time point across sites. And same thing with a floral diversity collection where I'm taking herbarium specimens from each of the sites to see how does this diversity play a role in spillover potentially. Because diversity can either... Increased diversity can either increase uh, disease prevalence in a system. That's called the amplification effect hypothesis, where with increased diversity, there's increased disease. And that's because that would be for a pathogen that has a wide host breadth or how many species they can infect. So it doesn't really matter that there's more species to pathogen. That just means more hosts, uh, more susceptible hosts. On the contrary, there's the dilution effect hypothesis that is the opposite pattern. With increased diversity, there's decreased um, disease. And overall, that sounds very nice <laughs> to me as someone who is always uh, preaching this idea that we need more diversity uh, in general, specifically, definitely in the agricultural system, for sure. We should not just be dependent wholeheartedly on one bee species to be doing all of this work. Um, that's a very precarious system to be a part of. Um, and so with the dilution effect hypothesis showing that with more diversity, that actually protects um the other species in the system and decreases the overall pathogen prevalence. So I wanted to I want to get into that arena and see what's going on here. Overall, I focused on four bumblebee species through time. Um, unless there's bumblebee people in the audience, I won't go into this. Um, but very excitedly, I've also started finding Bombus occidentalis, that previously mentioned endangered bumblebee, across almost all of my sites now. So that's very very exciting. Um, shows that this is still like kind of a stronghold for Occidentalis to be um, in a healthy population. 
So the first question, are viruses circulating in bumblebees before honeybee arrival? The answer is yes. Um, Saccharid virus is at 80% prevalence and black queen cell virus is at 40% prevalence. So very cool, very interesting, um, kind of gives hints towards are these pathogens able to circulate even without the honeybees present there? Are these bumblebee pathogens in origin? What's exciting about this as well is that I had, this is from 2021, but I have samples from the previous year as well. So I can go look at those, um, do all this molecular work, sequence them and see, are these related strains, which would suggest that this pathogen can successfully overwinter in that bumblebee, which would give even more credence to this idea that this is a bumblebee pathogen in origin. But they didn't have deformed wing virus and they did not have Lake Sinai virus. Um, honeybees, um, after, once they arrived, this was their, um, viral composition. They had a lot of black queen cell virus. And so pretty much it's mean prevalence. So then it's just, um, the number found infected over the total. Um, and then the sites that I have found honeybees at on the, on the x-axis. And overall, Lake Sinai virus is the next most prevalent one. And then very little deformed wing virus, which is interesting and not usual for the story of honeybees. But these bee keepers specifically are trying to breed for this mite resistance. So they're trying to bring up breeders that are able of the honeybees that are able to keep these mite numbers low. And I didn't count the mites, but this kind of is showing evidence towards them doing that because normally deformed wing virus is very associated with this mite. They're able to keep numbers very, very low. So it seems like that breeding is working. Um, but interestingly enough, um, no evidence of saccharide virus, um, the one that was super uh, in the bumblebees. And I don't have a graph to show this, but I will say that honeybees throughout that whole season never got the sac root virus, but it maintained in the bumblebees. Um, so that's really, really interesting. Very exciting. Um, I'm pumped to keep processing this work and seeing the dynamics of these other viruses too. As I said, I've been also finding Bombus occidentalis, this endangered bumblebee, the Western bumblebee. It used to be, it was used to be the most common bumblebee in San Francisco, actually, um, but has since just disappeared from most of the state and is now pretty much still surviving in the Sierra. Um, but they've gone to other states, like in Oregon and Washington and in Colorado, they're doing all right. Um, but in California specifically, they're not doing so well. Uh, here's my undergrad, Anna Hatsakis, who is doing her honors project on this bumblebee with me. We're trying to figure out what is this bee feeding on. And I got a permit from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to look more into this uh, bee in there. What are they? Are they infected with anything? You know, is this acting like a refuge for, for these bees? Um, yeah, so pretty much I got a permit from CDFW to, to work on that, to look at their pollen, to look at their pathogens. And I included this little, um, this message that I got from somebody who's working with their team that got to go out there um, when I gave, shared them the locations of all these sites that I found them at. And uh, Dylan said, thank you for helping them find it. It was sweet to hear a bunch of scientists turned regulators able to go out and see the species they're trying to protect. So like that just, you know, warmed my heart so much because a lot of them hadn't seen this species alive in California so far as they're the ones working on the permitting and the protection under the Endangered Species Act. So that was all very special. Um, they're indicative because they're mostly black on their bodies, but have a little bit of white just on the tip. White on a bumblebee is pretty, pretty special for this region. Um, but there's variation in all that. Um, in summary for that section, viruses are already circulating in bumblebees before honeybee arrival. Um, honeybees bring viruses with them when they migrate, um, but it seems like breeding for virosis resistance shows um, a protective property against the deformed wing virus, at least. And we can see that there's differences depending on, depending on the virus that you're looking at, which I would expect. Um, I'm going to pause there because I feel like I've already been talking for a bunch um, and take any questions for that section. So Nina, you have attracted some questions and actually one suggestion of from Mark Schmidt to um, start um, folks getting interested in bees in the lands around LBNL. But um, I'll let, perhaps let you discuss that with Mark. But um, there is one um, question about bees and do they have immune systems? 
Um, and can they be vaccinated? So yeah. that's coming from Eve Menger. Thanks, Eve. That's a that's a great question. The immune side, I'm, you know, I'm I'm delving into with under looking at the upregulation of their immune genes and stuff. So yes, they have an immune system, but they don't really have an immune memory like with vertebrates. So it's not like they generate um, antibodies like we do. Um, but they have cool evidence of transgenerational immune priming. So it's like immune priming is kind of the way that we could think of vaccines working. So pretty much if the mother bee was exposed to a pathogen, she can have that transgenerational immune priming for her offspring to say like, hey, you should be upregulating these immune factors, whatever those might be against this pathogen, because a lot of things there's trade-offs we always think about trade-offs in our lab. So mounting an immune response takes resources and the resources you're putting towards that can't be put towards other life history traits like reproduction, um, growth, flight, things like that. Um, so they're not wanting to have all of these different immune functions upregulated all the time when there's there's nothing to fight. Um, that will be costly to them and they will lose out to something that's not doing that type deal. There is one bee vaccine that's been developed for American fowl brood, um, which is a bacterial pathogen that kind of works in this way where they um, do like some amount of exposure to it. And there's an immune priming that can happen um, pretty much that just happened. <laughs> um, and that's a really important bacterial disease because if you find your hives infected with it, then you have to burn your whole hive because the, 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 the spores from, or I uh, call it a spore and bacteria, the infectious agent of the bacteria can survive for like 70 years <laughs> in a latent stage. And so it's just waiting. And so you have to burn everything. So it really sucks. Um, and so they've developed a vaccine for that. I'm of the mindset that you're, there's not enough money going into this, nor is that like a sustainable ecological system to be trying to seeing all these different pathogens and trying to create a vaccine for every individual one? I just don't imagine that there's ever going to be that much money going into it when we just like keep finding more diseases. Like diseases are a natural part of an ecosystem, but the problem is um, how stressed <laughs> animals are. And so the, the same sort of pathogens that they've always been co-evolving with are now um, getting a bit out of hand. So they are developing so, them. Nina, that that kind of leads directly to a question uh, that Don Mastronardi asked, which is, could you say a bit more about poor diet as a factor and maybe poor diet and the conditions that make them have to use energy resources to combat stress or to deal with stress? So that kind of ties into your alternate paths for how we manage this that you were just yes. discussing. Yeah. yeah. So I, whenever I talk with the public, I always say like, if you want to do something to help the bees stewarding land, whether or not that's your garden, whether or not that's a community garden in, 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 in your area, um, with a diverse, uh, bunch of flowers because bees are, and all animals are making decisions based on the, the like life history strategy, like life history trait that they're trying to maximize at that time. So different things require different different things require different food sources and so food types so mounting an immunological response requires protein protein is the substrate for immunological response and that comes from pollen so pollen is protein and nectar is carbs and additionally the there's some evidence that's very fun of and cool about the effect of plant secondary metabolites as uh, medicine for bees so they won't forage on this plant when they're healthy because it has some cost but when they're sick they'll forage on this and it helps them clear infections so pretty much stocking the bees pantry as i say and giving them as much diverse floral resources as possible to be making all of those choices um, is what's necessary because for bee honeybees at least that go and pollinate almonds we always say like, you wouldn't feel too happy and healthy if you just ate pizza every day for like two months straight, right? It's just one type of food resource and it might not be the type of food resource that they need to um, be fighting that pathogen, for example. Um, pretty much they need different food resources depending on what they're trying to do at the time, whether or not they're trying to grow a colony, whether or not they're trying to fight a pathogen response. And so having poor diet 
or low diversity diet has been shown to be associated with them not being able to fight off pathogens as well. Um, because again, it's all the uh, fighting off disease requires resources, it requires calories, it requires protein. Um, Camille, should we um, take a few more questions or should we continue? Um, what's your advice? Um, I think. Oh, go, <laughs> yeah, go you're, you're um, it's it's really up to Nina on how she wants to go through her slideshow. So, Nina, there are like two or three more questions. Would so what what would um, now or at the end of the talk? <laughs> I feel like, I mean, it's hard to time these things. And since I'm just like talking, I feel like I, I this is a naturally good end point. And I would love to focus on questions if people have have more questions. Let's, let's do that, that because I think these kind of all do tie together to the answers you're developing. So Rosemary mm -hmm. Clem wants to know more details about where native bees live. Mm -hmm. um, and that ties in with, you know, what kind of environments they need. Yes, yeah, so native bees, um, most are solitary bees. Um, of the 22,000 species of bees in the world, 90% of them are solitary. So we think of them as social, like the bumblebees and the honeybees, but that's actually just 10% of all species of bees. And it's kind of a weird strategy. But we think of them as that way because that's what we use in agriculture. But most bees are solitary, so they don't live in a hive. They live... Um, primarily underground. Um, most of them are ground nesters, 80% um, of them, I think. And then the remaining ones uh, nest in like twigs and plant materials and logs, kind of wooden cavities. And so for social bees, there is a reproductive class, the queen, and a non-reproductive class, the worker. But for solitary bees, the female bee is both the reproductive class and the worker. So she's doing all of the jobs and she's pretty much go emerging in the spring, mating, finding floral resources for her babies that she's then going back to her little nest that she's either dug or found and then laying her egg on a little pollen nectar patty and plugging up that tunnel and doing that again and again. And so you have these little tunnels of baby bees. Um, then that mother bee dies after, say, some solitary bees are alive as adults for only two weeks. Um, so it's not that long. Most of their lives are spent as babies um, overwintering until the next season. Um, so, yeah, a lot of native bees um, are spending a majority of their lives living underground. Um, yeah, so they're not in a hive or anything. So I always think that that's kind of surprising for people, too. Hmm. Um, there are two kind of related questions. Lily Pang wants to know how the use of pesticides might affect bee immunity and whether it, pesticides could make them weaker or more susceptible. And then with a specific question, VK wants to know if doing a termite treatment in her building might hurt bees and other beneficial insects. So um, the urban bee issue, I guess, or at least bees around mm -hmm. buildings. But could you yeah. comment on those? Thanks. Yeah, the chemist, the the pesticide side of things is a whole, whole another can of worms um, that I find very confusing due to the to the latent history of pesticides in the U.S. You know, being from wartime efforts originally, and then we create a ma mass monoculture system in which we're dependent on externalities such as insecticides and herbicides because of making mass monocultures that are not seen anywhere else. You know, in nature, and so therefore, um, yeah a lot of thoughts for that but um yeah oh, yeah it's um shown to have this antagonistic effect where um exposure to pesticides in addition to other stressors such as disease are you know they work badly together um overall a lot of the data that we have for pesticides is for honeybees um which again as i mentioned are a very different life history strategy than most other bees they're in a box they're alive all year the exposure is very different you know their their uh activity time so a lot of pesticides are like oh don't spray them when the bees could be active but some native bees are active at different hours and they're in the soil. And so anything that leaches into the ground is very different and wouldn't impact honeybees in the same way. So overall, we've seen the there are uh, antagonistic consequences for bee health with 
when interacting with pesticides and disease. Um, and then most of the knowledge that we have is on honeybees and people are trying to expand that. But like right now, you know, for most things we don't know, some things, you know, I think that they could be fine if done well. Um, but other things I feel like we just don't even know because the metrics that we're using are all for the honeybee, which is a very different species. And so for this idea with the termite treatment, um, the termites would be in the, I'm not sure how termites are treated for, but since they live in wood, I assume that it would go right into the wood. And so I think other than the only things that I could think of be, be cohabitating with the termites necessarily would be carpenter bees. Mm -hmm. Um, but they like to, they like to nest kind of like in your decks or like kind of higher up. Um, so I wonder if they would be kind of safe from that. Um, yeah, I, I bet that, I bet that the, the, I bet that the carpenter bees would be the kinds of the ones that I'm most concerned of because they are, would be the only ones that would cohabitate, I guess, with termites. Um, but if it's just a treatment to the wood, then I think it'd be okay. But I'm not sure how much the impact of that leaches out into the environment around them. Do you, Nina, do you know if any pesticide um, applications um, are, have been um, regulated or at least considered uh, for their effects on beneficial insects? Like, would that affect the timing of when they're yeah. Spread? Yeah. Yeah. There has been regulation of that. Like I said, where they, 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 I don't, you know, I'm not actually sure at what level, like who would be checking this, you know, necessarily, but I do believe there are regulations, at least on some level, um, to not be spraying them during their active, like honeybee active flight period. So doing it kind of in um, once the sun has set or below before the sun has risen, things like that, um, doing them at specific dosages. Um, I I was recently at a conference um, about international pollinator health in which there was a combination of both um, practitioners and academics. And a lot of the research can go into just being like, this is how bad it is, you know? But a practitioner who was trying to like read the literature was kind of gave this like, who was working in blueberries in Maine where they were really trying to do their due diligence of like, okay, we don't want to use pesticides, but like one time in the year we do have to, and we want to do that in a way that is least impactful. Like, please tell us how to do that. You know? Um, so I think that there are ways to minimize impact. Um, but a lot of science goes towards describing how bad something can be rather than okay given this idea that some farmers have to use pesticides sometimes this is what you have to do to minimize harm and so these practitioners were like please just like outline what what, what do we, what can we do so mm -hmm. i think it's still being figured out with some amount of regulations existing but then the story gets complicated like in the eu they banned neonicotinoids mm -hmm. which are a pesticide has been shown to be bad for for bees and beneficial insects but the consequence to that is because they didn't have an alternative pesticide um they've gone to um people that use pesticides go to things that are less specific so at least this neonicotinoids were to um invertebrate specific and so now they've reverted to pesticides that are like also impactful to humans so oh. it's just a real complicated story out there and the chemist chemistry side of things is intimidating to me so i feel <laughs> like that's all I'm comfortable saying about pesticides people can feel big feels about it for sure great um i have a couple of questions but are do you have any other um cosmic conclusions that you want any other points you want to make before i ask my two little questions or sure we Sure, yeah. I can go, go um, for it. Yeah, wrap this up. The Great. last little plug is of the work that I do locally in Marin County, where I'm comparing feral honeybees, um, those that have established in the wild, these commercial migratory operations, and then I expanded it even to looking at the you know backyard honeybee keeping operations. So they are managed by a human, but they don't migrate, um, and sampling them through time. 
and the bumblebees that they're interacting with through time. Um, and in Marin County, anybody that's been out there, you know that it gets dry super, super fast in the spring. And so as things dry up, there's fewer flowers, there's more stress, there's more overlap on any of the flowers that exist. So I would say that my guess is that my hypothesis is that viral prevalence and load would increase through the season. Um, so I do this temporal sampling. This was a 2021 figure, but I've done it in 2022 and 2023. And um, my professor and I joke that I have collected uh, enough data for four dissertations worth. And so all of this doesn't even go to my dissertation. This is for a postdoc. So. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh wow. Okay. Three years of sampling and that doesn't even make it into the dissertation. That's fine. But if anybody's local to this area, this is the sample. This is the sampling scheme. Some of my sites, I think I have even more at this point mm. of, um, sampling that I do and the patterns are different across different viruses with sac root virus again put po po like emerging as something that's interesting even in this very very different system um, where as you can see on the bottom right the prevalence on the on the y and the time on the x through the season the feral honeybees in gray didn't have sac root virus until the final time point um, but then when I was looking in the bumblebees it was there the whole time. So oh, again, no another problem. little piece of evidence, another little interesting tidbit that perhaps this is a um, bumblebee pathogen in origin. Mm. So overall, sometimes people can get, at least academics in the bee world can get very anti-honeybee, um, which the bee fights are, I'm just like, you know, we're all on the same side. We all want bees to be healthy. Uh, but a lot of these, you know, the consequences of honeybees, um, whether or not that's disease transmission, whether or not that's competition with native bees. Um, overall, honeybees are just a symptom of the underlying problem of industrial agriculture. Um, so they are just an externality um, that's required for our agricultural system because of how we designed it. So we made monocultures that are dependent on us bringing in chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, and bringing in pollination because there's nothing to be doing that around. But that doesn't have to be the case. You know, we designed it that way um, and we can change that. So overall, all these problems that I'm, a lot of these problems of diseases that I've been talking about, those are industrial agricultural problems. And overall, we know almost nothing like about viral transmission, um, which is exciting for a PhD student like me. Um, pretty much anything I find is new. Um, so that's <laughs> very cool. Um, so that's nice. Um, but re it's also kind of scary how little we know, like truly, I pretty much know all the B virus people that there are out there. There's not many of us. Um, so we need to keep looking into this. We need to keep researching this. And overall, the management strategies, whether or not they're the feral ones, the small scale beekeepers or the large scale beekeepers, all of them have the potential to be full, filled with viruses. And so they need to have, we need to be managing this, this introduced species and make sure that they're not having um, unintended consequences on the wild animals that they're interacting with. So that's just the last, last little bit. Um, so now I'll open up to questions. I'll see if there are any more on chat or, um, and I don't see any, I'll ask mine quickly and then we'll keep, uh, we'll keep you on so that people can just speak out or if you want, raise your hand. I think maybe speaking out might be the best, but I'll speak out. Um, you've invoked flowers as part of the solution, diverse flowers, which is wonderful. Um, how much do we know about, you know, the how long does the virus live and stay infective when it's on a fire flower? How about that vary among types of flowers like snapdragons, if they're inside um, a petal part or or exposed on a daisy and then uh, the seasonality or other conditions must really affect that too but that seems a whole really rich area and especially if we were to do making agriculture and nature play more nicely together by flower design that would be really interesting yes, yes. people are thinking about this definitely 
different flowers are going to be more or less disease transmission hotspots just due to the morphology of the flower alone. And so, like I said, these RNA viruses, they degrade. Um, we have no, like, no way, nobody knows. Nobody knows how long these flowers are infectious for at all um, from the viral side of things. But I always am pointing out that like these elevate high elevation sites in the Sierra, there is a higher UV index. So whatever that time period is decreases because oh. they're getting, you know, just hit with those UV rays much more intensely than something at sea level. So whatever that time is decreases up there, also potentially protective. Um, but then Scott McCart, uh, Cornell, and Quinn McFrederick at UC Riverside have pretty much made put in this giant grant looking at that, looking uh -huh. at these floral metrics um, for everything but viruses. Oh, no. <laughs> like a, oh, my gosh. They need a postdoc, don't they? <laughs> they desperately need one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think oh, that, I mean, very, yeah, the numbers are dwindling of my fellow viral bee researchers. Viruses are a pain to work with in, in a lot of ways, but hopefully I can hold on through these filtration events. Um, but overall, they're wanting to know exactly this. Um, are there certain flowers that are acting like disease transmission hotspots when we try to make these hedgerows, like these like rows of wildflowers and perimeter around monocultures to get some of these benefits that we're talking about, getting some of these nitrogen fixers, getting some of these additional pollination resources, things like that, natural predators um, in those hedgerows. But the last thing that you want is just like planting a bunch of flowers that are just disease bombs in there, you know? So <laughs> they're trying to do this whole analysis of all the different types of the corolla length, the number of petals, like they are trying to figure out are there certain floral traits associated with um, these pathogens being able to kind of hide and um, withstand any degradation? So it's in the works, but literally not for viruses. Oh, my. OK. But w w would you say viruses are one of the most important infective agents um, regulating or limiting bee populations? Uh, I mean, I can put that on my grant, <laughs> like, it's, you know, but I think that I think for me, I think that they're the most likely to be going between species. I see. Yeah. So the, the, the negative impact of industrial agriculture on honeybees would manifest the most in viral infections because they're the most likely to get into other bee species that, you know, don't have human mediated management that don't have these adaptations. And so when it spills over into them. The, yeah, it's just kind of can be a last straw at times. So I think that the viruses are important just from their spillover potential um, from this rapid mutation rate from RNA viruses not having a, um, what is it, the proofreading mechanisms that DNA based organisms do. And so they can just mutate like orders of magnitude faster than, <laughs> than anything else. And so they get into a new thing, into a new species and can mutate pretty rapidly and can try to deal with that new immune system. And uh, yeah, so I think that they're really important, <laughs> obviously. Right. I just scanned for raised hands. Now I'm scanning for more um, chat questions. And I'm not seeing any yet, but I bet they're forming in people's minds. So I'll ask you one other question. I thought it was, I thought your um, interpretation or inference about the long um, dormancy in the solitary queen um, and the virus can't kill her. Mm -hmm. So they just have to bide their time. And if they replicate at all, they can't replicate too much or they can't be virulent. So do you think that that, um, evolution in a solitary bee would select for um, not being virulent, would select against virulence so that the viruses that come out would be less harmful to all bees. So that ties into the condition-dependent virulence. So I think that um, that would be lovely, but I think that what the viruses can do is downregulate their virulence at a time that their host is hibernating and be latent. And then when they emerge and there's some physiological signal being like, oh, suddenly we're flying, you know, like suddenly like all the, all the physiological consequences of flight, all of that metabolic, you know, expenditure says, okay, now, now we start replicating. Now is a time that we can actually transmit forward. And so then the virulence can, can increase. So 
yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that it, it's um, in insects because of these long periods of dormancy often, like I said, the honeybee is a weirdo for being alive all year as a colony, but most, um, it seems like insect pathogens have this capacity to form latent infections as they bide their time. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Don um, has a question are the strategies being exploited? Are there strategies being explored to reduce mite populations? Do they have a native predator or a control factor in their place of origin? And I, and I also remember that um, beekeepers were trying to select for bees that had grooming behavior where a bee would chew a mite off of its fellow bee. Yes, yes, exactly. So there's not a native predator um, in East Asia where they originally came from, Varroa Jacobson I as the original mite. But instead, there was these this millions of years of coevolution where they have these complex social behavioral adaptations where um, when one sister has a mite on her, she does this specific dance or wiggle when there's other oh. bees around. She won't do it when she's alone, but if she has another sister around, she'll do a little dance. And that suggests these are called mite biters for her to the sister to come and bite off the little legs and that causes the mite to fall off um so right now if anything that there's this breeding endeavor um trying to happen right now which is um trying to breed for varroa resistance and that's actually chapter one that just got submitted is a review wow. about this very topic because a lot of there's going to be a lot of money a lot of incentive to go into varroa resistance breeding um, but in reality, we like me and my co-author scored through the literature and we saw that most beekeeping endeavors that are doing that are accidentally selecting for tolerance to the mite. So resistance versus tolerance on the outside, it looks like a honeybee that's dying less from being infected with these mites. So you're like, great, they're dying less. Let's We're going to select that queen. She's going to keep going. But if you don't count the number of mites on them when you're doing that, it's for reasons that I won't get into a lot easier to evolve tolerance. And so the difference there is that tolerance means that they can withstand being covered in these mites mm. and or being full of this virus and they don't get the same negative consequence versus resisting the mite is not letting the mite on them at all. So mm -hmm. that's this mite biting behavior. That's this grooming behavior. That's what we're trying to go for. Because when you accidentally select for a very tolerant organism, it's like bats, you know, like they're so full of virus because they're that's able right. to withstand the infections. Mm -hmm. So a honeybee that's able to withstand this infection, if it's getting other bees sick through environmental transmission, we argue that the tolerant honeybees could increase the force of infection or the number of virus particles into the environment and increase spillover risk for both the other honeybees that they're cohabitating with that might not have these adaptations, but also for the native bees that they're interacting with. So people are trying to breed for varroa mite resistance. A lot of people are accidentally doing tolerance instead. And so there's a way to do this in a way that, you know, um, gets us to the direction that we want to go to. We It would benefit both the honeybees and the wild bees that they're interacting with the most to breed for resistance. And we're seeing evidence of that, like I said, in the Sierra wildflower bees, that beekeeper only lets queens that are able to keep mite numbers between zero or one um, mm -hmm. per 200. They're the only ones that can go up there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that there, there's a mixed bag of what's going on. Um, but in the meantime, beekeepers have to do either a mix of organic or inorganic um, mite treatments using things like oxalic acid or other miticides um, to help the honeybees keep the populations low. Otherwise, the viruses can run amok. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. So more questions. I feel like those well, are all really good. Yeah. I wonder, you know, um, I think people might be interested in your art and, and what you're doing with it and how you do it. And it, it tells such an amazing story, like the your business card or my backdrop right now. There's the bumblebee and the honeybee and who knows which direction the viruses are moving and mm -hmm. how they're evolving. And, and that's, I, that's a very complicated story to tell so effectively on what is that a lupin, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can, um, I have, I literally like did a talk about, you know, how I use art in my science. So I can just do a quick little um, um, sharing of that too. Because it's to me a very important 
part and I appreciate that you appreciate it so much, Mary. Um, I'm also a very visual learner. So to me, it um, helps a lot and is able to communicate these complex ideas in a way that, you know, is, is, is kind of impossible with just words alone a lot of the time when you're first getting this information. So I've been just kind of an artist for a very long time. Um, just, you know, the kid to be doodling in art class and things like that. Um, but got back into it in college where um, I was, well, maybe I can show that um, I have slides of this, but Pretty much this illustration is of uh, um, the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. This Do I have that in another slide? Let me look. Because the Rusty Patch Bumblebee was actually um, my friend when I went to, when I got into Berkeley. Before I even knew that I said wanted to study bees, I literally never studied bees before. Mm -hmm. um, they um, were requested, like they asked me to do a... Um, um, commission that's the word i'm looking for a commission for them for this rusty patch bumblebee um and i was like oh wow you know this is the first ever bee to be listed as endangered by the federal government um and it was kind of a bit of a what's the word like an oracle moment of <laughs> who knew that i would be going on to to study endangered bees subsequently um so i illustrated that but also to zoom out and talk about um this outreach that i do with it i do a lot of art and science workshops, both with kids and, and adults, originally through the Bay Area scientists and schools where I went in to a local elementary school and showed them how I use art in my science um, and included this like activity book of like design your own like native bee uh, haven where you can choose your favorite bee, their favorite flowers that are blooming throughout the season. And a bunch of them even made like dioramas, which like I hadn't thought of a diorama in so long, uh, <laughs> but they made them, which was super cute. Wow. Um, I've been working a lot with the Communication, Literacy, and Education and Agricultural Research Project, CLEAR, um, which is the through the Plant Microbial Biology Department here at Berkeley. And I originally created these native bee coloring book pages that were going to be for a farmer's market event that CLEAR does, but then the pandemic hit. And so then it got transitioned into a Bay Area Science Festival like Zoom event where I did this live drawing of a bee and had like a panel of bee biologist friends that I had. Um, but on the right is all these different, it was like we had like a little contest of kids submitting their, um, you know, the coloring book pages that they did, um, hmm. which was very fun and um, the best that I could do in the Zoom context. But since then, I've been working a lot with the Lawrence Hall of Science, with CLEAR, also just going out to ranches and doing these events myself where I bring um, um, these native bee coloring book pages that I've designed and there's little games and trivia and stuff that kids can play with, learn about, pretty much get the spiel that you all heard about native bees and things like that. Um, and then kids can take this native bee coloring book page home, it has fun facts on it, has my contact information in case people have more questions about bees and overall trying to get people understanding that there's so many different species of, species of bees out there. Um, but then for the training with my artist side of things, I um, originally would, got my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in Canada, and um, I took a museum study course, which this crazy um, building on the right is the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh -huh. um, and when I was there, did it show me? Um, I, we were getting a tour and someone showed me this microscope that had this attachment on it called a camera lucida, where that is a piece on the microscope that you can look into the microscope and then see um, kind of like a reflection of a piece of paper and your specimen at the same time. So it's like a series of mirrors such that you can get proper tracing of the proportions of the insect. It's not a very, it's kind of hard to see. So it's mostly just for proportions and then work uh, with bio to create the illustration of the specimen. So here on the left is a is a hover fly, a surfid fly, mm -hmm. and then here's my illustration. This was one of the first ever like true blue like actual biological illustration that I did, which was, you know, it's not about, you know, art just looking or silent, something looking pretty. It's like, no, it has to look exactly like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the person who was teaching me, um, Julio Rivera, Dr. Julio Rivera, who is a PhD candidate at the time, was using these techniques 
for redoing the entire praying mantis phylogeny because apparently that was a mess and he was describing new species and stuff so he was using his illustrative prowess to do that and he was teaching me how to do this on the side um, where I would come in on a weekly basis and like work like this thing took me weeks because <laughs> as you can see on the left the the legs aren't like perfect they're all kind of you know when an insect dies they kind of curl up and stuff mm -hmm. and so then you're like working with these transparent layers and so you're moving the insect and then you're getting that one leg perfect and then you're moving it again and getting that second leg perfect on a different piece of paper and then all the different pieces and then you overlay all of those things together and then you outline it again and then you're going back and forth and back and forth between the microscope and the specimen to to get these these final touches so the stippling that took forever get it mm -hmm. but i think that the stippling where you get those little tiny dots works really well because there's a bunch of like little pores on the exoskeleton of the insect and stuff like that so it took a long time but proud of it <laughs> on the left we have an ant mimicking tree hopper which are these teeny tiny um they're in them they're a crew bug kind of related to cicadas and stuff but in there in the family membracid which are crazy little bugs and here's my illustration of them again julio was trying to give me um different like ta like different challenges and so the challenge of trying to get the different like shadows of this projection off of the pronotum of the insect which if looking from above these are called ant mimicking tree hoppers and from above they look like an ant wow. um so they're native to south america probably those ants aren't very nice but in general we don't really know <laughs> like how how this happened exactly <laughs> but they are tiny, tiny little weird little aliens. Oh, so yeah, here's the rusty patch bumblebee, like I said. And uh, I was working at Harvard at the time. And so I got to go into their collections and they have like the type specimen of this rusty patch bumblebee. So that felt very, I didn't touch that one. <laughs> but it felt very special to be, to be working with the originally, like this is what was used to describe this species specimen. Um, so this is again the poster child for endangered bees in the US. Um, the first ever bee, the first ever, yeah, bee to be listed first ever insect, I bet. No, maybe the butterflies got before that. First ever bee for sure to be listed as endangered by the federal government. Um, and this was a, the question slide of my last, um, the last little talk that you saw. And this is a Pepinapis squash bee. So they are specialists on squash. And this uh, thing coming out of their mouth, that's their tongues. Bees have very different tongue morphologies. Some are short-tongued bees, some are long-tongued bees, and they're co-evolved to deal with different um, corolla lengths of flowers. Um, so this one, all the ones that you saw previously, those were all pen and ink versus this this one is digital illustration um where i was just staring into a microscope and then looking at my ipad and, and illustrating it that way um some more pen and ink insect stuff i like i find as far as art goes insects to be very forgiving like people who want to draw human face humans are very hard because you have a pretty good and is it a search you have a pretty good image of what a human face looks like in your mind and so a deviation from that and art kind of pops out a lot but insects they're already so strange they're already so alien that a deviation from what they look like is pretty forgiving <laughs> so i always say that they're they're a very fun thing to draw in my opinion oh here's this uh, do i have an illustration no um this is kind of hard to understand what it is. It's a crane fly. So those like, they call them mosquito eaters, even though they're not. Um, but those like big mosquito looking flies um, and their legs pop off all the time. So the legs are are not here. But again, Julio was trying to give me something that has these like different, the, the side of this thorax has so many different kind of grooves. Mm -hmm. And so using stippling in a way to give this this essence of a of a thorax that's kind of dipping and, and, and coming back up again. Um, so yeah, he, he challenged me, um, during the <laughs> pandemic, I did this illustration of the three horsemen of the apocalypse, um, the rhinoceros, the bat, the pangolin, the pangolin, who again, is not being shown to be actually this, the intermediate host most likely, but, um, mm. was still a very charismatic creature and the mink, which was the, uh, 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 animal that is getting infected with COVID. Um, so that was kind of a usage of colored pencil versus these are more botanical illustrations. Um, the right is a series of my mother's favorite uh, flowers, garden flowers. Whoa. She, <laughs> she wow. specifically requested that one. And then on the right is a study of strawberries. This is um, like a digital illustration versus a watercolor illustration of Christopher 
Chrysococcus aratus, which is a beetle that was being used um, to try to do biocontrol of an invasive vine, worked on them in a forest entomology lab in undergrad, and uh, the graduate student that I was working with requested that I um, draw the uh, figure for her paper, which is really nice. And then some digital illustration too, this is a little param, I worked in a paramiscus lab for a second, and then I've done like this red panda um, study as well. And this is the, huh, I should have put this in the, in the original presentation. Um, this is this idea. This is what was submitted with that paper about varroa resistance I was talking about, where on the left, you can see an illustration of resistance um, versus on the right, you can see, uh, oh, of tolerance, sorry. Um, and on the right, you can see resistance. So on the left, they're covered in the mites, covered in viruses. And so the likelihood of spillover is higher versus on the right. They, they're down to maybe zero or one. So there's very few mites, very few virus, and so less viral spillover in the environment. So this is kind of the graphical abstract, if you will. Um, and this is just, uh, this is when I like to relax a bit more. All of that, I li sometimes people see all this and they're like, oh, do you want to like do that as a job? And I'm like, man, like, no, no, I respect it so deeply, but it's so, it's so challenging um, to get something perfect, you know, to get something that is that species description, you know what I mean? Um, and so <laughs> this is kind of what I do to have more fun. And this is kind of just how, I don't know, this is my doodling, essentially, where it's I sure can look at an so animal. Escher did this with armadillidium. He has a very similar <laughs> drawing of yeah. armadillidium that's kind of imaginative, like your seahorse there. <laughs> Yeah, so I illustrate it. Um, I draw the outside of it and of the animal that I'm focusing on, and then I fill it in with sort of kind of human made inspired materials or designs. Um, this is a bull that I illustrated for my father because he's born in the year of the bull and the month of the bull. And so he's a very um, hard headed man. <laughs> but um, in, in a very, I get a lot of my strength from him type deal. So I illustrated this mechanical <laughs> bull for him this crane, um, a dragonfly with lace in the wings and plates down the side. So this is kind of how I, this is more so how I unwind a more creative art versus not just um, me trying to justify time for my art by making it associated with my work. <laughs> this is much so more for me. So I wanted to share that kind of whole gambit. Um, so yeah, that's that's yeah. kind of all the different ways that I use art in my Thanks so much. My science. And I wonder if you could provide um, maybe um, um, us with the LIR series um, with links to your art and your outreach and where you get the coloring books and and the, the kids yeah. stuff that's popularizes this. And then also um, Martin Schwartz, I think, was providing a link to mm -hmm. some ideas about um, establishing a LBNL um a uh, beekeeping um, group that he'd like to to promote. Yeah. And then he has a video too that he's shared with us that we can make public. So we can have some a little follow-up for those that are really engaged with how you're communicating um, this and then also for how we might all envision a future that is friendlier to wild bees and, um, and happier honeybees. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that gives me incentive to to update my my art website. Sure. <laughs> so I, that's, I should just pop the the, the PDF because I like to share the PDF of the coloring book pages with teachers and stuff too locally. Right. So if they're ever teaching about bees, like an easy worksheet to to add into the mix as well. So I should just um, put that on my website. So I'll I'll prioritize mm -hmm. that and, and share yeah. that link with you all soon. Super, thank you very much. Um, that's been yeah, a great it was, presentation. It really was, Nina. Thank you so much for doing it. Bye. Thanks for listening.